I want to thank you all for joining me and our fantastic speakers today. Today, I have Kelly Skeff with me. Uh, Georgette is unable to join us live today, but has contributed to our presentation, and Kelly will be presenting on her behalf. Kelly Skeff is Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine at Stanford and specializes in internal medicine. He is co-director of the Stanford Faculty Development Center and a former residency program director and associate chair for education. Kelly has trained over 400 faculty development trainers who have delivered teaching improvement courses to over 30,000 medical teachers, postdoctoral scholars, and social work faculty from over 20 countries in North and South America, Europe, Australia, Middle East, and Asia. And Georgette Stratos is a senior research scholar at the Department of Medicine at Stanford. She is co-director of the Stanford Faculty Development Center for Medical Teachers alongside Kelly. Georgette specializes in educational psychology and developmental sociolinguistics. She has also trained over 400 faculty development trainers from around the world to deliver teaching improvement courses in clinical teaching, end of life care, geriatrics and primary care, medical decision-making, preventative medicine, and professionalism in contemporary practice. In addition, she has presented teaching improvement workshops to thousands of teachers around the world. So thank you for being here, and I will now pass it over to Kelly. I will do my best to convey our discoveries and our insights that we have together discovered over the last four decades. Uh, as we contemplated what to do today, uh, we have thought about our work during the last uh, several decades and found that the field of clinical teaching is so complex that even our 14-hour course is a synopsis of that field. And the synopsis of that field is also contained in our new online course. But today we don't have 14 hours. We have 30 or 40 minutes. And so what we decided to do was to highlight and to distill some of the key issues that we try to convey in our larger course uh, so that each of you could walk away with something today that you could use in your own teaching, but also give you some sense of what we do as we go into this very complex topic uh, in greater detail. Now, why did we come here? Why are we here? What we've discovered in our work is that clinical teachers are faced with many, many challenges. Here's a picture of one clinical teacher in the center of this stage. Uh, and he's working with a medical student who's presenting a case, the supervising intern of that medical student, the supervising resident of that team who is there in the center somewhat, as you can tell, a bit tired from his uh, on-call night. Another medical student says, standing dutifully, listening to his colleague. And behind them, a day float resident. Uh, this resident is responsible for the patients and the patient care that goes on when this team goes home. So this particular faculty physician is responsible not only for thinking about what is it that I have to consider in the care of the patient, but what do I have to consider about the care of the patient that I want to make sure that this group learns? This group in a one-room schoolhouse, which has multiple levels represented, multiple levels of experience, multiple levels of knowledge, a setting that's not perfect for teaching, but has some benefits and some drawbacks, and also a content area that is extremely complex. In the field of clinical teaching, all the teachers have to consider what knowledge they wish to convey, what skills they wish to help the learners obtain, and what attitudes, what professional values do they hope get conveyed and absorbed and embodied in how these particular trainees in medicine become the professionals that they hope to be. So in that complex set of challenges, we have tried to look and say, is there a way to make sense of this? How can you look at this complex area where you're thinking about content and setting and learners and concepts? And how can you bring it to bear to where you can think about it and understand it in a more organized and systematic way? And so that led us to work on a conceptual framework for reflecting on teaching 
And that's the framework that forms the, underpins the entire basis for our work, our course, and which I will touch on today so that you get some sense of that interest, some sense of the concepts, and some sense of a checklist of a conceptual framework that you can use as you think about your own teaching. During this webinar, we hope that you will gain several things. We hope that you will gain familiarity with this framework so that you can use it to analyze and reflect on your own teaching using this common language of the framework. That you can examine and break down your own teaching in a structured and comprehensive fashion so that you will feel after you've applied this framework to your teaching that you have looked at most, if not all, of the major areas in teaching and have at least considered and reflected on them. And also it helps you both recognize what you see and classify what you see, but also by working through the framework, you may discover what you did not initially see so that you can both recognize what you see and what you do not see in teaching interactions. Now the agenda we're going to use today <clears throat> is going to be made up mainly of an introduction to the Stanford Faculty Development Center's framework for analyzing teaching. But toward the end, we will also touch on the background of our work that has led to the online teaching improvement course that is being offered. Well, here is the framework, a list of seven categories, seven categories that we've seen can be applied in any setting, in any time, with any group of learners across topics. And what we will do over the next 20 or 30 minutes is work through that framework with the definitions of each particular component, each particular category, and we'll highlight just a few of the examples of the relevance of each of the categories in that framework for clinical teachers. We'll highlight what we have learned from our experience with hundreds of course participants as they've shared with us the challenges of clinical teaching and the discoveries that they have made by applying this framework. So let's begin. The first category in the framework is the learning climate. Creating a climate, creating a place that the teacher wants to have that will have learners want to be in that place. The formal definition, as you see here, is that the tone or atmosphere, that represents the tone or atmosphere of the teaching setting. Is it stimulating? And is it a place where learners can comfortably identify and address their limitation? Now, why are we focusing on this? Because in medicine, the limitation of a learner is crucial to the ultimate capability of that person to practice. And if we've created a scene, a place, a scenario in which one is uncomfortable to identify and admit one's limitation, those may be hidden. And is this a problem throughout one's career? Yes. As we've learned from risk management experts, that sometimes even fully trained physicians have difficulty addressing and admitting their limitations. So the informal definition of this category we would highlight is, have we created a place where learners want to be? And we ask ourselves the question, would a learner want to be here? And would a teacher want to be here? Is this a collaborative environment where the teacher is excited about being there every day? Or is it an adversarial environment which makes it hard for people to want to be there? Now, why is this so relevant to clinical teaching? As I mentioned before, admitting our own limitations is challenging, both for learners and teachers. The concept of saying one one doesn't know carries such a weight as one has gone through the entire educational system. And yet it's crucial for physician training with implications for patient care and implications for the stepping stone for lifelong learning. The admission of limitations being a stepping stone that one can use to continue to guide oneself as you learn throughout a career. So we highlight for you that this particular point, that admitting limitations is a challenging area, is one that we want you to have in your mind as you try to create the learning climate in your teaching setting. 
The second category is the category of control of the session. Now, I would highlight in introducing this category that the first two categories, the learning climate and the control of session, are unique among the seven. These two categories are ever present. At any one moment in a teaching session, both the learning climate and the control of session are categories that are present. Why? Because as you see in this formal definition, this category, the control of session, deals with the manner in which the teaching interaction is focused and paced and the leadership style that a teacher will use. Those particular issues are going on all the time. A teacher can be thinking about their focus and their pace and who's leading the session. And the informal definition here has to, say, has to deal with how well is this session managed? We know there are so many things to accomplish when we are active as a clinical teacher. And we may choose in deciding who's in charge, where does the teacher work, who is in charge of that session. Now, the relevance of this to clinical teaching is that clinical teachers may choose to use many different leadership styles. We cover three in our course, a directive style in which the teacher makes the decisions about what's to be covered, how long it will take, who's to be doing what within a teaching session, a democratic teaching leadership style in which the teacher collaborates with the learners and together make decisions about how the session will be run. And a non-directive teaching style coming from the work of Carl Rogers, where the teacher really lets the session run itself and observes what's going on in the session. Now, what we've noticed is that participants who've taken our course recognize that they have a preference often to use one or another style. And what have we learned? That many particular teachers in, t in uh, clinical teaching have been taught to use a directive style where they are in charge, they are the responsible person. And indeed, from a medical clinical point of view, the teacher is the responsible person. But in setting up the teaching session, they can be used, the, all three of these styles can be used, a directive, a democratic, and a non-directive. And so what we've learned is by teachers reflecting on what are the goals of their session, that they may realize benefits from using alternative leadership styles, that those alternative styles will optimize opportunities for them to evaluate learners in different stages of development, and also provide learners opportunities to develop their own leadership abilities, a critical thing in professional training. This leads us to the third category, the communication of educational goals. What does this deal with? This deals with the teachers taking advantage of the opportunity to establish and explicitly express the teachers and the learners' expectations for the learners. We like to emphasize the preposition for, because this category addresses how does a teacher decide what they hope for their learners? It's not only what they hope of their learners, what they expect for them to do, but what they expect for them to be able to do, capable of doing at the end of a teaching session. And it answers the informal question, why are the learners and the teachers there? Why are we here? What do we hope comes out of this session for our learners? A very important area, something that has been uh, in the forefront of education research since the, er, the 1950s, the middle of the last century. Now, why is the why are the uh, communication of why is the communication of goals important? Well, because it enables us to accomplish three functions. By being explicit about our goals, it lets those that we teach know what to master. It also may inform you and me as a teacher on how to plan our instructional process. And it provides us, both the learners and the teachers, with the basis for assessment. But what have we learned? That despite the educational value of communicating our goals, as we watched clinical teachers, we rarely observed teachers overtly expressing those goals. 
interestingly enough, there was a an assumption, an assumption that everybody knew the reason why they were there. And often that was at a very high level, that they were there to take care of patients, but not at a specific level of what was the topic, what were the, what were the skills, what were the attitudes to be mastered, what were the hopes of those teachers and those learners for themselves and for their colleagues. So with reflection, teachers can see the benefits of communicating goals, especially when learners are not performing at a desired level, being explicit about the goals, the hopes of what you hope they will master. And learners who are unclear about expectations. I personally have had the experience where I, in the midst of a teaching session, would realize that the learner, that my trainees and I were on different pages because they were trying to accomplish a different thing for themselves for their day than I was hoping for to help them gain. And so there was lack of clarity about the expectation. So we've learned that this can be a very useful, not simple, but a very useful exercise to begin to define the specific goals that we hope for the learners and the activities that they will go through to master those goals. And it leads us now to the fourth category. This very large category that often encompasses entire teaching courses, the category of how does a teacher promote the understanding and retention of material to be gained? What do you and I do as we try to help other people master material? The formal definition deals with the approaches that a teacher can use both to explain the content that we're hoping people master. How are we as explainers? And also to have the learner meaningfully be engaged and interact with the content, assisting the learner to understand and retain it. That it's not enough to have the teacher not only be a great explainer, a clear explainer, but rather to also be someone who orchestrates an opportunity for the learner to meaningfully engage with the content so that they can tr have a true understanding and retention of that material. So the informal definition asks the question, what techniques did a teacher use to help the learners learn the material? And again, this material is material about knowledge acquisition, material about skill acquisition, and content about attitude or value acquisition. Now, why do we spend time on this? Because of the frailty of the human mind. The human memory is a wonderful thing when it works. But here, from 1885, the curve of forgetting was defined. That you and I, as we learn something, have a long and quick decay of our memory of that knowledge. That this goes away. And unfortunately, the mind has not progressed so, much, so great in the last over 150 years to where we don't forget things. We still forget things. So our, our task as a teacher is how do we counter this? How do we enhance the capability of remembering? Well, I'm going to touch on now four different areas that are relevant to clinical teaching that have been discovered by our participants and have seen to be useful. Now, there are many more that are covered in our course, and obviously there are many PhD theses written about each of these topics. But for example, as we hope to organize content to where it is effectively understood by the learner, we might use overviews. Sounds simplistic, but crucial. You might imagine what happens when you walk into a session and a lecture that you're a little late, and suddenly you see a slide that shows the overview of what's being covered. And you take a breath in to say, I know where we are. I understand the organization of the content. And we might, as teachers, recognize the challenge of defining new terms to enhance clarity. That as we work in our fields, teams which were terms which were sometimes vague to us in the beginning are now commonplace, and we may or may not think about defining new terms, a very useful activity. We might want to use drama 
to emphasize the key content. That it is appropriate and okay to recognize that teaching is a performance, a performance with a very legitimate and important goal to help people learn about their profession. So being dramatic to make things stick, to emphasize, can be useful. And the last point is that engaging the learners in the content to help them to master it by reformulating it so that we feel the recognition, which many of us, and I certainly have failed in this in my own teaching sometimes, that if I think too much about what I'm doing, but not how am I going to engage the learner into a process that allows them to reformulate and better understand the content, I may miss the boat. I may use all of these techniques in the first three, but not really successfully getting the material to be mastered by the learner because I haven't actively engaged them. We now move to our fifth category, a category laden with emotion, evaluation. As each of us think about being evaluated ourselves and evaluating others, we often have an emotional response. Is somebody going to judge me? Is this going to actually be a performance of mine that is not positive and in fact will affect my entire career? A medical student who's presenting may have that fear that if his performance is not evaluated well, his entire residency program application gets affected. His letters get affected. Her letters get affected. If somebody's judging us. So this emotional area of the evaluation of the learners has an impact on how we check on whether things are learned. If we look at the formal definition, it simply states that this is the process by which the teacher assesses the learner's knowledge, the learner's skills, the learner's attitudes, based on criteria related to educational goals. Well, indeed, if we have our goals for the learner, it would seem incumbent upon us to check with a process on whether we had accomplished our goals. And yet, this is so laden with fear for so many people that it's often not done adequately. The informal definition asks the question, does the teacher know where the learners are? And indeed, as I've highlighted for you, this is extremely relevant to clinical teaching because we've learned teachers are commonly extremely kind. And there's fear built into this phenomenon that the teacher is hesitant to put the learner on the spot, that the teacher is hesitant to make somebody feel uncomfortable, that the learner is fearful of being evaluated and not successful. We were in the midst of a seminar recently in which a senior resident and the surgical rotation, could have been any rotation, commented that it was only in his final two or three weeks of his training did he lose the fear of what he was going to say on rounds, that he lost the fear of being judged inappropriately. Because in medicine, the concept of one being evaluated by others is a concept that is crucial to us learning from each other. And yet evaluation can be left out. This critical process for understanding the learner's needs. So we highlight and try to encourage people to think about evaluation as a positive exercise, as a place where the learner and the teacher both can learn about where the learner is and move forward in that process. Well, it leads us to the category number six, another emotional category, the category of feedback, providing feedback to the learners about their performance. And we see the formal definition the process by which the teacher provides learners with information about their performance for the purposes of improving their performance. We often suggest that people think about this, put it on their wall, 
because giving feedback has this wonderful purpose of helping people grow, helping people get better. And it answers the question in the informal definition is do learners know what the teacher thinks of their performance? Has the teacher shared his or her observation in a way to where the learner understands the perception of others? Well, why is this a topic of importance that we are asked to commonly present? Because it's very difficult. Telling somebody else about what they're doing well, even, or what they're doing not so well, or where they could get better, is a difficult challenge. And yet in teaching, and in the teaching of a professional, this is crucial that a person learns what they're doing well and what they're not doing well from a perspective of another observer who has more experience and maybe more knowledge or at least different knowledge. But sometimes teachers feel that giving feedback is uncomfortable and even confrontational or adversarial. And so that is a, a, a task that they often avoid. And we just gave a seminar a week ago where one of the teachers said, you know, we're always wanting to be kind and nice and therefore we avoid telling people what we're saying, not recognizing that the gift of feedback of a teacher letting a learner know how they can improve. It's a gift whenever it comes with the caring of the teacher. And so there is a hesitance to give feedback and we've seen by many, uh, by many teachers, especially corrective feedback, and many people change the word negative to corrective feedback and positive to reinforcing feedback to give them more courage to do this. Our course participants have found it helpful to capitalize on prior uh, categories that I already covered this morning and the envisioning the effective feedback, envisioning effective feedback as resting on a three-legged stool. And here is that three-legged stool. That if one supports the provision of feedback with three other categories, which I've already covered, with creating a positive learning climate in which the learner knows about how much the teacher cares about them, in which the learner is respected and can feel comfortable admitting their limitation, in which the learners see that the purpose of being there is for the teacher and the learner to gain together. And the category of communication of goal, where the clarity of what the goals are that the teacher hopes the learner will accomplish is made straightforwardly so that the feedback is in relationship to a goal and better understood by a learner where the feedback sometimes actually comes out of left field, out of a out of some place that the learner is not aware of. So communicating the goals can enable the effectiveness of feedback. And the third leg of the stool is the adequate evaluation of the learner by the teacher. Sometimes teachers have to give feedback about observations made by others. And so the learner may doubt the validity of those observations. So having the teachers who make the observation do the adequate evaluation, be involved in the feedback process, can enable the learners to more effectively gain from this knowledge, these observations by other teachers. It leads us now to the last category, the category which we call promoting self-directed learning. This category is somewhat different than the other six. The learner is crucial in all seven categories. But this category, promoting self-directed learning, takes advantage of the inherent drive and motivation that each human has. It takes advantage of the individual learner's needs, the individual learner's goals, the individual learner's interests. So this category deals with approaches that you and I as a teacher can use to take that motivation and to influence that motivation, to bring it out into the teaching setting and to use that motivation to capitalize on the use of resources 
a technique to fostering self-directed learning. So we ask the question in this category, is the learning that's being done by the clinical teacher being driven by the learner's motivation, by the learner's needs, by the learner's goals, by the learner's interest? And many of us, because medicine is such a big topic, may have clearly defined what we believe somebody else should know and not taken advantage of this incredible, powerful force inside of every human being to continue to learn. Now, why is the challenge and why do we want to spend time on this? Because it's possible that self-directed learning, learning driven by the learner's own desires, goals, and interest may be suppressed. That when the workload gets too high, the desire for me to learn about even things that I'm interested in, when the content volume of what the teacher has to cover may be so big that I may forget that I really came to this institution to be a resident, to be a student, because of my own drive. And with the concept that we've having to struggle with now in medicine of burnout, that when we have lost our fire for what we're doing, that that may in fact diminish our desire to do self-directed learning. And teachers themselves can contribute to suppression. I can say this because I've had the experience. Getting asked a question about which a teacher may not know and then recognize, oh my goodness, I'm changing the topic Somebody has an interest. They bring a silver platter of a learner desire, interest, goal. But the teacher who feels uncomfortable at that moment may choose to change the topic to something the teacher knows about. So we, as frail human beings as well, may contribute to the suppression of self-directed learning. Now, we also found that teachers who recognize that we may not be taking advantage of the power of the learner began to capitalize on learner motivation. That way we can, in the midst of our teaching, begin to look to the learner to guide us to their needs, their desires, and their interests. And why is this category so important? Because when the teacher disappears, it's that the learner's self-directed mm -hmm. learning, the learner's recognition of their own gaps, the learner's desire to go to resources, other people, other uh, web resources, the guy the desire to even go to, to, to go to patient for learning will lead to the professional growth beyond training. Well, we have tried, as we've looked at this, to separate these seven categories into distinct entities solely for the purpose of trying to get a grasp about, on them. But as you see by this particular diagram, these categories do not live alone. When one affects the learning climate up here in the upper left, you affect your capability of communicating stringent educational goals. When one improves the learning climate to where it's a safe place to address our own limitations, we may in fact improve the learner's desire to be evaluated by the teacher and the learner's desire to hear feedback by the teacher. And when the learning climate is open, the learner may share their desires, their own self-directed learning motivations. And you can walk around this particular circle and see each of these categories influences all of the others. So although we've separated them today, what is often very fun and useful is to consider how does one category facilitate the implementation of another. So why do we want you to have this checklist, this framework, because it will assist you with analyzing this complex activity of teaching. And it's like the review of systems, which all clinicians are familiar with, where we recognize we may forget something about a patient. And going through a systematic review can enable us to discover things that we may have forgotten. And this seven category framework may, can, can provide a structured and comprehensive approach for you for your own teaching. And it'll provide a common language so that you may say to someone, well, how is the climate? Something now becoming very important as institutions are looking at themselves. Well, how is the climate? 
is this session adequately controlled in a way to make it useful? And then again, as we've said before, it may help us recognize what we see and what we don't see in a teaching interaction. So as we look back on this still shot of this faculty member with his team, we can see that he might ask himself, gee, what is the learning climate? Would this student on the left-hand side of the screen be willing to ask a question if he didn't know the answer? Or would he feel that it would be more appropriate? I just recently met with a group of students where I said, would you ask a question on rounds if you didn't know the answer? Seven of the eight students in the room said no, because I may be judged inappropriately, and I may be judged not by, interesting, by being interested in learning, but only whether or not I already know. So he may ask questions about the learning climate. He may ask questions about, is this session controlled? Am I covering what I need to cover? He may ask questions about the goals. What do I hope for each of these learners? It's an exercise to do that for everyone. Imagine this the attending physician asked, what does he hope the day flow resident will master as a result of this presentation? Does the presentation enable him to emphasize the things he wants to be remembered? Does it enable him in this setting to evaluate where the learners are and to provide feedback to those learners? And does this session enable him to see where the inherent drives of each of these learners are coming from? What are their motivations? What are their interests? What are their goals? Well, the experience we've had in presenting this course in a lot greater detail over the years has brought us to the point where we now are working with Jackie and others uh, at Stanford have now developed an online course which will become available. It's an adaptation of our in-person uh, course that we've done for three and a half decades. We've grounded it in as much educational theory as possible and the empirical studies of our own and our own observations in working with teachers and learners. We've tried to do our best to have it cover universal principles so that a teacher who masters these concepts can work in different cultures, in different settings, with different content and with different learners. And we've had the wonderful experience of working across different national cultures, ethnic cultures, and teaching cultures, from basic science teachers with a certain culture, to clinical teachers with another culture, to residents in training with their own culture, and with postdocs and their culture. We've tried to incorporate multiple instructional methods in our facilitator training course and in the course that our facilitators now give, but also in our online course, that there are multiple ways that we're asking the person who takes that course to think about the material in a way to help them gain what they can from this course. And the course will enable a teacher who goes through it to have specific suggestions for improving their teaching practice related to the conceptual framework that I've covered today. And finally, it has been incumbent upon us, it has been our goal that the teacher remains the decision maker, that we are not suggesting that we are going to teach anybody the way to teach. There is not the way to teach. There are multiple ways to teach. So we've tried to embody a non-prescriptive philosophy that enables the teacher to have a bigger menu, to have a more complete understanding from which they can choose how they wish to choose their teaching behaviors and work with their learners. So I thank you for the opportunity today to give you the synopsis of our course and how we're leading to the online course. And I will pass the baton back to Jackie so for our first question, Kelly, do you have any suggestions for how to deliver difficult or uncomfortable feedback to a learner? Well, what a wonderful question. Uh, I would highlight the three-legged stool that I um, showed in the slide, in, in the presentation. And that is that uh, in, in delivering difficult feedback, I found it very useful in preparation for the feedback to think about what I'm going to do to set up a learning climate that's going to make it a place where that particular person receiving feedback uh, wants to be. 
uh, can I convey to them that I care about them enough to want to give them that feedback? It was not uncommon for me to, to say that as a program director for a resident, to say it's my opportunity to tell you about something that you may not be aware of. So to let them know the caring that I have for them and to let them know that whatever it is that I'm commenting on is very likely, and I found this to be probably the true really 100% of the time, that the issue that they're facing is faced by many others. So the admission of the limitations of a learner in that setting and the caring of the teacher, I think, sets the stage. It's then useful, I think, to think about the communication of goals. What is it that I hope this learner will be able to do if they take the feedback that I'm given, that I'm giving, and use it in their career? So to ask myself, do I have a full definition of those goals? Is it knowledge? Is it a skill or is it an attitude? Because it's often about attitude that is most difficult to give feedback to a learner. But to try to define it, what is the attitude? What is the behavior that I'm hoping somebody will manifest to display that attitude? And then finally, have I done an adequate evaluation? So I may say to a learner, I only observed you one time, but in that one time what I've seen is this particular behavior, which I think will either help you in the future or, in fact, make it more difficult for you. Now, interestingly enough, I've had a situation where a resident might say, well, I'm not too worried about this evaluation by this particular instructor because he actually only saw me for one day. Now, I sometimes suggested to a resident at that point to ask, how long they think their job interview is going to be. It's commonly less than a day. And in fact, knowing how one is coming across in even a brief encounter can be instrumental in helping that person decide what it is that they wish to do with their behaviors in the future. Mm -hmm. As Malcolm Gladwell said in the book Blink, so many people make instant judgments about certain behaviors instantaneously and so I would hope and, and I'm hoping this will be helpful to you to think about the preparation with the learning climate the communication of goals and the evaluation and then with that caring person with a particular goal I can then say this is what I've seen and this is what I hope for you and then in collaboration with that learner because we are teaching professionals professionals who don't simply want to hear what somebody else has to say, but want to collaborate in the discussion. So asking the learners, what do you think about what I've just told you about your performance can be very useful. So I hope that is helpful to you. It's, uh, I can't give you a hundred percent guarantee. It will always work, but it will always, I think it will make things easier and hopefully give you the courage to do it. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that answer. Um, so the next question, um, and this is, I think, more about how we're delivering this content online. Um, and so maybe you can go a little bit into how, um, how we do the scenarios, but how can we perform role play online in this course? Well, that's a difficult challenge for even the in-person courses because what you're highlighting, and I want to give you credit for it, is what you're highlighting is the mastery of teaching skills often requires practice. And it's that practice that has brought role play into the forefront of teaching seminars. So in this case, what we're going to have to do in the online course is we're trying to capitalize on two other concepts that Al Bandura brought out in his work in psychology. And that is not only what he called participant role playing, participant modeling, when you practice a behavior yourself. But also two other kinds of modeling, vicarious modeling in which you watch somebody else do something. And because you do have the capability of using those ability, those particular actions, you can watch somebody and then do it. And then symbolic modeling. Symbolic modeling is represented by the conceptual the con conception of doing the behavior. It's as you practice in your mind 
doing the behavior. Something that sports uh, sports coaches have learned for a long time. The replay in the play of the activity before. Many surgeons talk to me about the fact that they replay the surgery before they go do the surgery. So in the online course, there won't be an example and an opportunity for us to do an observed role play. But what we're hoping that happen is that you'll do symbolic modeling in your mind about what you plan, vicarious modeling, because we're going to show you many different videotapes of teachers actually teaching, reenactments of the actual teaching that we develop. And then hopefully, in some cases, those of you will work on the course as a group and be able to practice the behaviors yourselves. So unfortunately, there isn't an opportunity to do the practice in there in the online course, but we will capitalize on the two other types of modeling, symbolic and vicarious, to try to get you on your way to doing the actual implementation. I want to highlight for you the point that you're making, that I think you're making in your question, is that the mastery of a new behavior requires practice. So I would encourage you, all of those of you who take our full course or regular course, whatever the course is, that as much as possible, identify the time when you wish to practice the behavior you're, pl you're planning to use. Wonderful question. Great answer. Thanks, Kelly. Um, the next question is, as a corollary, when giving difficult feedback, how might your recommendations change if a new or junior faculty is providing challenging feedback to a learner to make sure the feedback lands successfully and the new or junior faculty remains protected? Uh, did I hear the new or junior faculty remains protected? Is that what I heard? Correct. Protected. Yes. Well, two very, very challenging issues. First, I would try to capitalize uh, mm -hmm. for new or junior faculty on the fact that at that particular stage, a stage which I passed some time ago, mm -hmm. uh, at that particular stage, you have the opportunity to be what the educators will call a near peer, a near peer, that if you are new as a faculty member, you probably have a greater grasp of what the resident or students or interns are going through than somebody who has been away from the training program for a long time. So first, I would encourage you to recognize that you have a capability that people who have been well beyond that new faculty member definition no longer have. So you can say in your introduction to your feedback, I have recently been where you are and the credibility and the utility of being there recently can have merit. Now you brought up another point, and that is that you want to protect the teacher. Now, why do we have to talk about this? This is a sad point. This is a sad point. The teachers now are fearful of the evaluation of them by a learner because of how that may affect their career. So we now have seen that uh, teachers have just been like learners who are fearful about how they're being evaluated, that teachers may avoid very effective educational behavior for fear that the learner will not like it and therefore will reject it. So my encouragement at this point would be to make sure as much as you possibly can that the reason for your feedback is sincere and honest and for the benefit of the learner. If they can recognize that the reason you're giving your feedback is for their benefit, and I've just had the wonderful opportunity to work with a young faculty member in this regard. The explanation to the learner as to the rationale for the teacher's behavior becomes very important. So I would encourage you to do those, those several things. Explain to your and your peer explain your observations as clearly as possible and explain that the rationale for you doing this is for the benefit of that person and all the patients that they will touch afterward and all the colleagues that they'll interact with afterward. Now, I cannot give you a 100% guarantee that it's gonna become a simple process. It never was a simple process for me, but I think it can be a more effective process if you add those particular uh, adjunct behaviors. 
Thank you so much. Wonderful questions. Perfect. Thank you, Kelly. Um, the next question is, I have students that reach a point where I know they will not pass my course. So how do you communicate this to them and help them figure out what their options are? Finish the course and try again or drop right then and there, but also support them and help them find another way to achieve their goal. Gee, what a wonderful, another wonderful deep question because you're talking about career choice in some cases here. How can I let somebody know that out of my course and my teaching, we've discovered something about them that might guide them to a different area? Well, it might guide them that we may not be approaching the course, or they may be so fearful that they're not really being able to put forth their best efforts. So first one would want to check that in fact, somebody is not capable, capable of mastering the material. And in fact, I've had that experience where somebody might change fields because of capability. And I'm a believer in capability. I think I'm a far less good surgeon than I am as an internist. I believe in capability. And so it may well be that you are doing something very useful for your learner to say to them, here's what I've discovered, here's what I've seen, here's what I hope, and here's where I'm concerned. Now you and I are in a collaborative model now the teacher and the learner. You and I are working together on your career. So we have to decide, is this the right place for you and can you master the skills necessary? Or is this not the right place for you? I've always felt that we have to be open that many people are choosing their careers on the basis of an inadequate amount of knowledge and that the thought about changing the career should not be something that is actually totally avoided at all. One of my poster children in my experience, has been one of my residents who told me, because he was not performing well, that he really did not want to be a practicing clinician. And so we enabled him to leave that field. And then he became a very famous, a very famous and very successful World Health Organization expert. So I think the fear of people changing fields, obviously they put a lot of time into medicine, but we want them to be happy for their careers and not being doing something where they're always on the edge of being not successful. Thank you. God, these are wonderful questions. Thanks, Kelly. I think we might have time for one or two more. We have actually a lot of great questions here. Um, so the next question is, um, and this is a great one also, how do you know that as a teacher, you are correct when you give negative feedback and not just prejudice or at the end of the day, it is just your subjective opinion? Boy. <laughs> well, you're bringing up a whole lot of wonderfully new issues, all the biases that we're now learning that many of us have had as we're making our evaluation and giving feedback. How do we know? I think the best thing we can do is to tell people that this is what we see. Mm -hmm. Where the, the um, insistence on ourselves, that when we're giving feedback, we're talking about the observations that we've made so that there's not an argument about what we interpret, but rather a discussion of what we observe. So that what we know we can be certain of is this is what we saw. What we can't be certain of of what was the intent and what it may mean to others. So I think if we can say that openly, I'm gonna tell you what I saw, I'm going to tell you what how I interpret it, I can tell you that it may be interpreted in the same way that I am by others. And if we think, that the learner's changing of that behavior uh, would be useful for them in their careers, then I think we're, giving, we're offering them what others may feel about their performance that they don't know. You know, there's many famous lines about seeing others as other people see us. You know, that we don't see ourselves as other people see us. And yet in medicine, in, in all many fields, in all the fields, Knowing how other people see us is going to be crucial to our success. So once again, there's an honesty coming here that uh, we're, or that I'm thinking can be very useful and something that I think the field of medicine can be very proud about and start doing more than we're doing now. An honesty about our commitment to our learners and an honesty about our observation of our learners. Great, thank you so much. I guess we have time for one more, Jackie. We can throw in one more. Um, let's see here. So 
The next question is, can you give some suggestions um, on how to improve or establish a good learning climate? Well, there are many, and this is going to be making me want to invite you to take the online course because <laughs> in, the, uh, in the online course, we're going to give about 40 different, no, at least I'm, I'm doing the math here, about 20 different suggestions for improving the learning climate. Suggesting suggestions dealing with the four components that we highlight for the learning climate. We suggest that the learning climate is, a, is made up of four areas. The area of stimulation, an area where the teacher can let learners know about how much he or she cares about their learning. The area of involvement, an area where the teachers say to the learners, I really want you, however hesitant or reticent or quiet you are to be a participant in this inner exercise. The area of admission of limitations in which we can acknowledge the limitations that others have and point out the utility of those to further learning. And finally, uh, the area of you and I admitting all the limitations that we face, the area of respect for limitations, that we can acknowledge where people are, but we can also highlight for them that it is fine and it is a useful thing to talk about the limitations of ourselves, the limitations of others, the limitations of the place we teach, the limitations of the content that we teach. All of those, I would think, can be suggestions that might enable you to make a more positive learning climate. We highlighted in this morning's session only one, the admission of one's own limitation. And that's powerful. Because a teacher who says to a learner, I have a limitation and I've made a mistake in this area and I don't want you to make the same mistake. The idea that as professionals, the mistake should not be made multiple times. It should be made once and passed on to others. Mm -hmm. So that opening up the mistakes as stepping stones to learning can be another way to help the learning climate. So there's a few suggestions. And uh, like I say, it makes me want to either have you take the online course or the live course. However, we can get you more information would be better. Thank you so much for all of these questions. Great. Thanks, Kelly. All right. Well, I think time flew by. It's about time to wrap up the webinar. Um, again, if you'd like to learn more from Kelly and Georgette, we encourage you to join our Mastering Medical Teaching course. You'll have over 12 hours of content um, to learn from them and other guest speakers as well, um, and access to videos and exercises to sharpen your skills. And again, as Kelly said, uh, learn more about providing a positive learning climate. And once again, thank you for joining us today. We hope you all have a great week and we hope to see you again in one of our next sessions. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you.